Hello, Zion, you belong here. We belong together. Indeed, we do. Today we are celebrating the ninth weekend after Pentecost. Zion Lutheran Church is once again hosting live corporate worship, and I want you to know that we have traditional worship services on Wednesday evening at 7 and on Sunday morning at 9.30, and we also have a blended service on Saturday at 5. If you're curious about attending our Wednesday service, our any of our worship services once again, I would encourage you to go watch the video that is hosted on our website, zionohio.org, and become familiar with all the conditions that we have to meet in order to have live corporate worship. For now, I'll just uh, encourage you all to keep your masks on the whole time you are inside the building, and when it comes to communion, I will give you special instructions. Our next food distribution will be on August the 15th. For more information on this and other activities in and around your church, I would again encourage you to go to the website, zionohio.org. If you want to receive the weekly edition of I Am on Zion, our weekly uh, newsletter, or uh, my daily devotion, the daily word, or the occasional word, or any of the occasional announcements that we put out, once again, go to the website zionohio.org and click on the subscribe button where you will be given all those options to choose from. I want to thank you all for your continued financial support to make an, uh, an offering. We suggest going to the website zionohio.org and click on the Give tab. The Give Plus smartphone app from your smartphone's app store. Or you can text to give, just text this number, 833-409-0694, and then in the body itself, text the word assist, and then follow the prompts. You can still reach us by the U.S. mail, and of course, we still have the old-timey offering plate, if that's what you want to do. Now, I invite you to stand and hum along as we offer our gathering song to the Lord. Reading from Isaiah. Ho, everyone who 
thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a person and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises to them belong to the patriarchs. And from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All who are able are invited to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there and boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. As you heard, Jesus had just heard that his cousin John the Baptist had been killed. We don't really know how close the cousins John and Jesus were, but Jesus knew that John was an important figure in his own life and in his father's plan to save the world. The news disturbed Jesus, and so according to Matthew, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But a huge crowd followed him into the wilderness. Jesus probably just wanted to be alone, but that's not what he got. Even when he went out to this deserted place, there were thousands of people, thousands of needy people. So Jesus healed them because he had compassion for them, as he always did. And so they went like they often did with Jesus, preaching and teaching and performing signs and miracles into the evening. The disciples urged Jesus to send the crowds away so that they might go get themselves some food. And then the thing that I think is the most remarkable part of this story happened. Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Where in the world 
do you expect us to get enough food to feed all these hungry people? There must be 5,000 of them out here, the disciples asked. Now, according to Matthew's telling of the story, the disciples could only scrounge out a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. Can't you just see them plopping them down in front of Jesus? But listen to what happened next. Matthew wrote, Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he, Jesus, looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. Here's my point. When Jesus blesses, there will be enough. Everyone ate and was filled. They had twelve baskets full of leftovers. Food just overflowed everywhere. I take this miracle as a kind of parable about Jesus. Although they were in a deserted place, the deserted place burst forth in divine abundance once Jesus got there. There was healing for the hurting and food for the hungry. But might it also not be a parable about his disciples? And not just the twelve, but also us, we modern-day disciples. We look at the vast needs of our church and our community and the world, and in despair we cry out to Jesus, Lord, can you work some kind of miracle and take care of all our needs? Jesus, send these needy people away. There won't be enough for us. We say we don't have much. I think we say that because we think we don't have much. But in this story, Jesus was not concerned at all about what his disciples didn't have. He wanted to know what they did have. Just a couple of fish in a basket and a few loaves. We say metaphorically, but we know that's not true. We have to save for our children's education, and then for their weddings, and, and then for our own retirement, we say. But the truth is, we live in an economy of abundance, even today, during pandemic. Yet, we live as if we live in an economy of scarcity. Our hoarding these last few months has been embarrassing. Jesus urges us to take what we have and recklessly share it, give it away, because he says it will be enough. He promises it will be enough. He promises there will be more. Well, perhaps it's human nature. We come into this world with a sense of scarcity. Already just out of the womb, we learn to grab or to accumulate, pile up a guard. It's mine, you can't have it. A little child quickly learns to say to anyone else. The Jesse family has been hanging out with another family for a long time, many years. And they used to have two big Labradors. We've been there when it was feeding time, and it's quite a spectacle. Each dog has its own bowl because they don't understand the concept of sharing. The food barely hits the bottom of the bowl before those dogs have snarfed it up. I yell at them occasionally to chew their food, but they don't listen. I'm told that one of the reasons that dogs often gobble down their food so quickly is that for the first few million years, when dogs lived in the wild, food was indeed scarce. When a kill was made, all the dogs gathered around the carcass and wolfed down the meat. It was important to eat fast before another dog got more food than you. So millions of years later, dogs are still gobbling down their food, even though there will always be more to eat. We better not let those Mexicans into our country that might take our American jobs. Don't give too much to those folks on welfare. It might drain our economy. 
Don't raise the minimum wage too much. It might make my hamburger cost more. Life is a zero-sum game. If I give to you, then there will be less for me. My wife has always taught in the inner city school districts. You may not know, uh, what you may not know is that sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, the lesson in the lesson plan may or may not be the most urgent issue of the day. Maybe it's consoling a kid whose father got hauled away by the police the night before. Or maybe it's feeding a child who came to school hungry because there was no one home awake and sober enough to get them breakfast. Or maybe it's getting clean clothes for a kid who's come to school every day this week in the same dirty clothes. Early in her career, teaching jobs were scarce, and that's how she got started teaching in the inner city schools. Teaching jobs are becoming more and more available. She could get a job in a better community, has been offered those positions, but then who would love those kids, she says. Lots of folks burn out in a scenario like that, like having nothing left to give. She's only been teaching poor kids for 25 years or so. Who knows how long she'll last, but she has demonstrated to me that love and compassion are renewable resources. The more you give it away, the more you get. As someone said, if you give it, you receive. I've heard church members I admire say much the same thing in giving to the church. When asked about it, they will always say, well, i found that the more I give, the more I get. Do they mean that if they give money to the church, somehow money comes back to them even more than they gave? Of course not. What they mean is that in giving some of their money to God's work, they have received great joy and satisfaction at being a part of God's work, at living in the kingdom of heaven here and now, like I mentioned last week. In the 80s, I worked in a manufacturing plant in North Carolina where we employed people younger than me who were part of the first integrated high school graduating class in the local school district. It wasn't that long ago that African Americans only had menial dead-end jobs. They were not allowed into the textile mills to work, never given the opportunity to advance to higher skilled jobs or the professional jobs. If you let the blacks in here, they'll take our white jobs, the good old white boys said to justify this economic injustice. Before I moved there from the north, those of us who were being transferred from Chicago down to North Carolina were invited to a little symposium on the realities of life in the south. One presenter, an economist, displayed some statistics that were rather remarkable. There was this economic advance in the American south, and as we looked at those graphs, one of those who were among us noticed this huge jump in the poor southern states' economies about the year 1968. What happened, he asked. The civil rights movement, said the economist. We in the south were trying to fight with one hand tied behind our backs. When black people were fully allowed into the economy, the economy really started to boom. When will we learn to trust Jesus? When will we learn some of his unrestrained, expansive, gracious lessons? When will we stop guarding, hoarding, keeping, clutching, and show the open-handed gesture of generosity? We come into this world with nothing and we quickly learn a sense of scarcity that doesn't exist in God's economy. But by the grace of God, we can learn another way. 
we can see that all we have and all that we are is but a gift of an incredibly generous God who asks us only that we respond to our sisters and brothers in the same gracious and generous spirit. Imagine a world with no hunger because the nations who had the environment and the technology and the intelligence to produce did actually produce and did it in great abundance. Would there be riots over food trucks in Africa? Would there be the need to protect borders if everyone was fed? Would there be a need for nuclear weapons? I know it's more complicated than that. But with Jesus, all things are possible. And he chooses to work through us. He is asking us, what do you have? What gifts have I first given you that you can return so that we can do some great work together. You see, we worship the God of divine abundance. God could feed all the starving people in the world if God wanted to, but then what would happen to our economy? Food prices would drop, and protest farmers would drive their tractors into Washington, grocery stores would go out of business, we would demand even more to make up for our losses in revenue. But I suspect that none of that really matters to God. I believe that if God fed all the starving people in the world, we would just get less compassion and do even less. God will feed them, we'll say. But God is more interested in our conversion into the likeness of his son, Jesus. And so God continues to bless us out of his divine abundance so that we can be a blessing to others, just like Jesus did to the disciples in the story today. He let the disciples bless the other people. Sadly, our problem is the same as that of the disciples in that story. The commodity in shortest supply is not food, or money, it's faith. How disappointed God must be that we never trust him to use us to deliver his grace. Here's an idea. What if we would simply have faith to trust in God? Then God would use whatever we have, great or small, and multiply it like those fishes and loaves in the story. And then maybe the greatest miracle that day might be the change that takes place in us. Join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for your divine abundance. We are so blessed, and yet it has been pointed out to us today that our abundance is also our burden. Help release what you have first given us so that we can receive the greater blessing of being a blessing to others. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us, and we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those who are able are invited to kneel. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As Paul did ordain minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Confident of God's care and upheld by the Spirit, let us pray for all who are in need. O oh God, our Savior, bless your church around the world, where believers must be isolated from one another. Be present through your gracious word. Give to our bishops, pastors, deacons, and congregational leaders wisdom for their tasks in this challenging time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, Redeemer of all, Bless the Jewish people with your covenant promises. Bring an end to global anti-Semitism and strengthen ties of cooperation and friendship between Christians and Jews. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, creator of the wondrous earth, protect the glories of your seas and lands. Replenish groundwater supplies, refresh lakes and ponds, send rains where there is drought, and shelter forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, sovereign of the world, form the leaders of the nations to strive for justice for all. Guide our government in dealing with China. Strengthen the world's democracies. Bring an end to racism in our society. Inspire our elected officials in how to govern with integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, storehouse of goodness, visit all who face the coronavirus, especially those who are incarcerated. Give us, O oh Lord of life, a vaccine. Assist all who face eviction from their residence. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body or spirit, especially those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you, either silently or aloud. Lord, be your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh God, give her bread. Teach us how to feed the hungry, the children starving in war zones, the families who cannot afford groceries, the homeless on our streets, the farmers devastated by pestilence. Give to all creatures their food in due season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, everlasting mercy, we praise you for the lives of all who have died in the faith. At the end, bring us with all your saints to your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love. We offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
Serving social distancing. 